That was so cool. What was that 36,000 transactions per yeah, second? Yeah, yeah. That's Amazing. kind of our limit. And but we can get around 50k with more expensive hardware, but cool. We don't have the money for that yet. So go home, tell your friends, tell your parents you just saw 36,000 transactions per second on a live testnet. It's yeah. possible. <laughs> All right. Cool. Up next, we have Arthur Brightman from Tezos. Take it away, Arthur. All right. Five reasons why Tezos rocks. Number four will shock you. Uh, this is a clickbait theme presentation. It's just a theme, but not a content. All right. Number one, one use case. Only people who've been around for, I guess, a few years will remember. It's not what you think, or maybe it is. Uh, magic internet money. So why do we build decentralized ledgers? You know, why bother with having so many computers around the world, validate everything, verify everything? You know, what is that good for? Well, for one, censorship resistance. You have, if you have many, many people who contribute to this one chain, well, at least, you know, if at least one of this person is not censoring you, then, you know, your transaction can go through. Uh, trust minimization. If everyone verifies anything, I'm not, I don't have to trust a central entity. And digital scarcity. That's why we need consensus. You don't need consensus for most things. You don't need consensus to run something like Usenet or to run something like IRC or all of this stuff. None of this stuff demands consensus. You want consensus because you're representing some things as scarce. So what is that good for? Well, I don't think a lot of things. I mean, I think it's really good for assets who derive their value purely from community consensus. And money is one of those. You know, the reason that money has value is because if I hold something and I can give it to you and you're going to accept it, you know, I value money because you value money because you're going to accept it. And there's some, there's, there's, there's other things. So domain names, for example, you know, why do I value a domain name? Because everyone had, has agreed that they, you know, they, they, they will look at this DNS system and they will rely on the DNS system to reach a certain website when they type this domain name. So domain name is one of these uh, assets that you can represent. And I think there are a few, and I think there are, you know, there are use cases beyond money. But too often, I think it is forgotten that this is the main use case. This is the most important one. This is what this technology was designed to do, and this is one of the things that it does well, it does a lot of other things pretty poorly because it is expensive. You have, if you have to replicate everything, it is, it is expensive. It is inconvenient. It is not suited for applications which do not need trust minimization or which do not need censorship resistance. So is that it? OK, so I, I see a few other uh, use cases. And so I would say. <laughs> One of the main use cases is censorship-resistant money. I see two other ones. So one is internet scale coordination. So if you want to have something like a decentralized polity, cultural movement, DAOs, and I don't mean the DAO, I mean a DAO, please do not pollute namespaces by picking generic names for your projects. Uh, so all of this very large scale coordination, that tends to work well on this type of, uh, of platforms, because if you have a very disparate set of people that needs to work together, that needs to coordinate, then maybe uh, trusted central third party are not a good fit for that. Uh, and the other one, which is uh, fairly interesting and probably uh, really related to, uh, to some of the efforts of Web3, is pre-commitments to ecosystem openness. Um, and it's the idea that web companies, they can contract with their communities. So, you know, an, an old business model is that I come in, I grab all the data that's possible, I build all the moats that I can, and I make sure that I'm going to retain all of this market power. Now, how do you displace a player like this, well, the way you do it is you realize that most of your community are the people who are creating your content, and you say, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to have an agreement with you. You're going to come on my platform. You're going to invest time and energy in creating content, but I am not going to become a monopoly. I'm not going to abuse my position uh, in this market. And that's possibly how you can attract more content uh, on your platform. And uh, yeah, so that's the competitive advantage against the entrenched player who are not using this model. So these are the other two things besides magic internet and money that I think uh, these blockchain systems are going to be very uh, useful for. And I would say that uh, these ideas are pretty central uh, in the design and the direction of Tezos. 
Okay, number two, lower your energy consumption with this one weird trick. GPU manufacturers hate it. So of course, I'm talking about proof of stake. But there are very different instantiations of proof of stake that, that exist. And most of the design that you will see um, rely on this idea that people are going to lock up capital. And by locking up capital, they are going to become validators. They're going to participate in the validation of the network. And I think already, if you start doing something like that, you're in better shape than with proof of work. But the Tezos uh, proof of stake algorithm has other design constraints. One of it is fairness. So the idea is that even if you hold something like 0.001% of the stake of the entire network, you should still be able to produce 0.001% of the blocks, and you should uh, be able to receive 0.001% of the senior age, that is, all the coins which are created to reward the validation of the algorithm. And I think this fairness uh, property is fairly important, and it's hard to achieve. So if you have any type of system where you have a fixed number of uh, validators that are in your system, you're not going to have this property. Also, if you, just, if you require capital lockups to do that, then you force people to have trade-offs. You know, you know, are they going to be diluted, or are they going to have to lock up their capital? And so another constraint you would want is, some, is having something close to capital efficiency. So that the senior that's produced uh, is not going to, it's not going to create, it's not going to require 80%, um, 90% of, uh, of the mass of this thing to be idle. Now, why do we care? You know, after all, if you have uh, a billion token, 10 million token, doesn't make a difference. So, you know, if 90% is frozen and the other one, and, and the rest is circulating, what does that matter? And the reason it matters is because if you have shocks in the interest rates or in the demand or in the trust that uh, people have in your token, and you have a lot of capital lockup, then all of a sudden you can have a high variance in the circulating supply. And a high variance in the circulating supply uh, can create a high variance uh, in prices. And so that's not necessarily a good, uh, that's not a good feature. So you don't want to have too much capital lockup. And that's really hard to achieve uh, both of these properties. What it gets you is non-dilutive inflation. So the cost of consensus by itself does not have to be high. Right? So if we wanted to have a secure, decentralized consensus, imagine we have 10,000 different computers, 100,000 different computers around the world, validating the, uh, the entire ledger, making sure everything is correct. Well, by itself, that's not very expensive. You know, the cost of computing is not that expensive. I think we've been conditioned to think of the cost of, say, uh, of securing the network by some of the proof of work historic that tries to equate the cost of signage with the cost of uh, maintaining the network. So, uh, consensus cost is minimal, and once that cost is paid, what you get is basically a non-dilutive inflation. So you have inflation in order to make sure that the consensus cost is paid, but it doesn't, it, it's not actually real inflation, it's purely nominal. So part of the design is to make it that departure from the consensus is costly, not consensus. You want it to be cheap to follow the rules and to act honestly, but expensive to make mistakes. So that's one of the... Uh, I would say, commonality of most proof-of-stake design. The other one is uh, you get decentralization. So mining has economies of scale. If I'm a miner, I benefit from having as many ASICs as possible and uh, uh, having a, a large operation that I can manage very efficiently. But stake has these economies of scale, right? If I have to hold stake, that's something that's risky. I don't want to, ho to hold too much stake. And it's something that you see uh, in the Tezos ecosystem, for example, uh, which has validators. Some validators at some point say, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to grow further because that requires me to increase my stake. So that's a force of decentralization. I think at the end of the day, the economics of any system that's uh, at equilibrium are going to push towards centralization. So this is always an uphill battle, but I think this is a good, uh, uh, this is a good battle to win. Uh, and so today there's over uh, 400 bakers, which are the block producers, who are involved in the Tezos ecosystem. Number three, they deployed a smart contract. You won't believe what happens next. So smart contract design language goal. So if you're going to design a language for a smart contract for your platform, there's several things you might care about. One is readability. You would like an expressive representation of the contract on a blockchain. Why do you want that? Well, if I go, if, if someone sends me a contract and say, hey, sign this, you know, enter that contract with me on a blockchain, well, I want to know what I'm signing. I want to know what's, what's going on. So the first thing you, you, you might do 
uh, or have some other party do is look at the code of the contract. But if the code of the contract that you see um, is in uh, assembly or EVM or some really low-level language, then it becomes hard to reason about it, and it becomes hard to decide it, what, what does this thing actually d uh, do. So one solution is to say, OK, we'll, we'll use a high-level language, and then our high-level language will compile to a low-level language. And then uh, if you challenge me, I will present to you the high-level implementation of this contract that you can read and understand. And then you can compile it yourself. And in order to do that, you will need several things. You will need uh, a certified compiler so that you can make sure that the output of the compiler actually matches what the language says, which is uh, non-trivial. And you'll need a deterministic compiler, of course, so that you can reproduce the build. So the latter is not too hard to get. The former is much harder. So in the design goal for Tezos, there was this idea that the VM itself, the VM language, could be readable. You could actually look at the contract and understand it. The second one is, can we engineer security at the language level? Can we have a language that prevents most common bugs? So common pitfalls uh, in uh, Ethereum smart contracts might be re-entry bugs, overflow. Um, there's a litany of those. And it turns out that by designing your language a specific way, you can avoid those problems. So for instance, in the design of uh, the Mikkelsen language for Tezos, one of the benefits you'll have is uh, calls to other contracts are not function calls. They don't go onto a stack. What you do is you wait until the end of the execution, and then you return a stream of operations, which are then put into uh, a list and then executed. So it's a two-step process, and it's much harder uh, to commit the mistake of having uh, re-entrancy bugs. It means that you can't easily use other contracts as just like libraries or function libraries, but it makes contract interaction a lot more natural and a lot more safe. And the third thing we would like is efficiency. So in current smart contracts, we still need to monitor gas cost uh, and make sure that we cut the execution beyond the limits that was given by the person making the transaction. And so we would like gas cost to be easy to monitor. So we can't have some things that's too high level. If you have just, you know, if you just in, in, implement an interpreter for a very high level language, you're going to have to track uh, access to variable tables and a lot of things. So you want a, a simple gas model, and you want to be able to execute quickly. Uh, and so the high-level VM we have for, for Tezos is kind of a compromise uh, here. So first, it tries to be type safe. Uh, so for instance, uh, the type of, uh, of data types you will find are uh, arbitrary precision integers. We don't have regular integers. Why? Because the overhead of dealing with arbitrary precision integers is minimal, but the cost for someone of making an overflow bug in a contract is extremely high. And I'd rather have this at the VM level than trying to count on the fact that people are going to use uh, higher level language, we won't have these issues. Uh, lists, sets, timestamps, amounts. Amounts are typed differently from integers. So you see, you have these very uh, high level data types that you can use, and that's directly at the VM level. It's concise. So uh, it's a stack-based language, which is uh, fairly expressive, and it limits the storage on the blockchain. If your contracts are small, they don't actually take that much space uh, in your blockchain states. Uh, one example, if you're into this, um, there's a good stack exchange called Code Golfing, where you have to uh, take a function and implement it um, with as few characters as possible. And the language that wins is a language that was designed to win code golf contests. And it's, of course, a stack-based language, because stack-based representation are extremely concise. And it's functional, so every smart contract is, is a pure function that takes in a message, a storage, and returns to you a new version of the storage and a list of operations that you want to apply. So it's purely functional. It's easy to manipulate uh, and reason about. There's a straightforward formalization in uh, COGS, the CRM prover uh, of, uh, of Mikkelsen. So uh, if you want to use this language as a compilation target or as a substrate for formally verifying your programs, it's very easy to manipulate. So those are some of the uh, general benefits of the, of the language. Where is it now? Do you recognize these protocols? So actually, yes, you do, because most protocols have not evolved that much. So just more philosophically, what is a, crypto, what, what is a cryptocurrency? So is it a protocol? Well, not necessarily, because you could have cryptocurrencies sharing the same protocol, but actually having different ledgers. Is it an algorithm? No, not, not really. Is it a snapshot of a ledger? Is it just a set of balances? Now, that's a tempting one, but it's not exactly true because, you know, I could copy the balance, you know, I could take a snapshot of Bitcoin tomorrow and run that 
but no one would consider it to be Bitcoin. So it's not just a, a snapshot. It's, not a, it's also not just a set of rules, because I could replicate those without replicating the currency. Is it a shelling point? So I think the general idea is that a cryptocurrency is a shelling point around a ledger and the set of rules for updating it. Right? So if you were to define what is uh, Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin is a set of ATXO plus uh, the rule that everyone agrees are Bitcoin rules, and there's a general agreement about that. But that, agreement, uh, that argument can change. So you have a dilemma in your protocol if you want to evolve uh, and change. You can have a protocol that's easy to change or hard to change. So if it's easy to change, now the problem is something is going to be unpredictable. If I'm building a new platform and the rules can change at any time, I don't, know, you know, I, I, I don't know what I should expect. I don't know what I should build. And it might be unre unreliable. The rules might change in a way that adversely affect me. Uh, and on top of that, you have social attacks vector. So uh, if it's a shelling point and you know, anyone can just easily move it, someone could try and claim it and say, you know, this is a true version of this, uh, of this ledger. This is how we do things. Uh, and then try to convince sufficiently many people that this is a new shelling point. This is what's going to happen and attack the protocol that way. Now, you could have a protocol that's hard to change. Uh, but the problem is that if it's really hard to change, you're not going to change that much. Uh, and since there's a, lot, a ton of innovation in this space, a ton of research, it's going to make you disruptable. It means you're not going to be up to date. And you're going to have social attacks vector anyway. Because if you're hard to change, if you don't have a procedure for change, the way you're going to change is by moving the shelling point. And so it is going to be accepted that somehow there can be social shifts in a shelling point. So you don't want that. And the way out of this dilemma is to have formal governance, is to say instead of just trying to pilot this thing from the outside, um, we're going to have formal rules on how to change a protocol. And so when people think about a Tezos, they mostly think about this formal governance aspect, or uh, as it's been dubbed, on-chain governance. And thankfully, it is the most misunderstood part of Tezos, both by imitators and both by detractors, which is fantastic. So uh, against, you know, against my, yeah, my better knowing, I'm, I'm going to explain a little more uh, what it's about. So it is not about participation or about the democracy. It does not attempt to be an approximation of democracy. You'll see sometimes criticism of on-chain governance saying, like, well, it wants to be democracy, but look, you know, they're voting based on a coin amount, so clearly it's not a democracy. That's, that's not the point. The point is not to try and give everyone a voice so that like, everyone can participate. I mean, th th that's nice, I guess, from, you know, from, um, from an aesthetic point of view, but that's not the point. The point is that if, we have to move, if you have to change your protocol, you have to have a way to do it that's reasonable, that is going to let people have a dialogue about it and have an understanding of it. It's not about hot fixes or patching the ledger. It's not about, oh, something happened in this, in this contract, and in sub-millisecond, we're going to have an AI governance system who is going to fix everything. That, that's not what it's about. The principles of an immutable ledger are really good. What's, but what, what, you, what you want to do is you want to be able to change your algorithm progressively. What you want to do is being able to move from uh, maybe one proof-of-stake model to a better proof-of-stake model. What you want to be able to do is support more transactions, more privacy. So this is what governance is for. But you don't want all these propositions to come uh, from a group which has the power to move the shelling point. And I'm not saying that uh, in projects which uses informal or governance or fork-based governance, I don't think there's any big conspiracy of anyone saying, you know, I'm going to capture the shelling point and I'm going to be the one making all the shots. I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning and does that. But the problem is if you don't have a coordination mechanism, then people are going to default to the coordination mechanism of just listening to a few people. And so that's why you need to have this formal mechanism. It's not about treasury management. That's a thing that some uh, blockchain uh, did. I think uh, one of the first ones to do this was Dash. And so you know, it, 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 it's, it's been a popular topic of discussion. And it's, it, it's a nice thing you can do with governance, but that's really not the, uh, the main aspect of it. It's all about preventing social attack vectors. Right? And it's funny because a lot of people who are opposed to this idea of governance, the only thing they think about is social attack vectors, but it's actually designed as a way to prevent that. It's as a way of saying, look, you have a new idea for the ledger, you want to change it, let's slow down, let's think about it, and let's make sure that you can pass these hurdles. 
Constitutionalism is another aspect of uh, formal governance that's often overlooked. So it's the idea that this is not just about voting. You can enforce meta-governance principle in code. So everything that I said earlier is this is not about this, this is not about that. These are principles that you can encode with governance. So the, um, there are two ways to do it. So there's a simple way, there's a complex way. Uh, the simple way is to use the uh, OCaml language. Tezos is an... Uh, uh, project building the OCaml programming language. So you have very, very strong encapsulation of modules in OCaml, uh, which lets you do uh, things like saying, OK, uh, if I'm ever going to create a token in this system, I have to call a function that lives in this module. And that's the only way I can do it, because the type is completely opaque. Uh, I cannot even add two amounts without calling this function. So uh, you can route a lot of the logic regarding tokens into a single module. And if you say, OK, uh, any, uh, any time there's going to be a protocol upgrade, and if it wants to change this module, I'm going to hold it to a much higher st uh, standard. So you can do things like limit issuance this way. Uh, you could require soft forks. So there's one popular philosophy in Bitcoin, which is that soft forks are better than hard forks, even though you can pretty much do whatever you want with a soft fork. But let's say we really want to do soft forks. You'll say, OK, uh, I'll add a module, and every block that comes in the network has to go through this module. And the only thing the module can do is either tell me I agree to this block or I disagree. So if you, if you do that and if you do governance rules that only let people add filters, then you basically have encoded in your governance the idea that you only want to do soft forks. I don't think that's a good idea, but it's something you can do. The more general way of doing it is with a proof checker. You can embed a proof checker in your protocol uh, and require proofs uh, for every protocol upgrade that you get that, yes, indeed, some properties that we care about are verified by this, uh, uh, by this piece of code. And one of the nice things is that um, the most advanced uh, serum prover you have today is a Cox serum prover. Uh, it's a very, very uh, tight-knit ecosystem with OCaml. And so there are uh, projects which actually let, let you take a piece of OCaml, a di directly piece of code, and prove properties about this piece of code. Modularity that will make your jaw drop. So this local mom was able to amend the protocol. Here's how. So the Tezos protocol is designed to be very modular. Um, there's different uh, uh, abstractions layer that goes through. So you start with a network shell. And that's just a process that runs on your machine that's going to exchange messages on a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's going to connect to peers. It's going to rate peers, depending on whether or not they ever send me bad information. Uh, and it's, it's going to relay all this message and then communicate that to a protocol. In the protocol, we have the different layers. We're going to have context storage, which is essentially, I want to store information uh, about my state, and I want to store that into, so right now it's a Git tree. If you want to move to some other uh, fancier cryptographic data structure, you can do that without uh, changing any of the rest of the protocol. So storing state information, consensus logic, which is essentially telling the shell, you know, this branch is better than that branch. And that's very generic. You, know, you can run proof of work, proof of stake, any type of algorithm uh, that's based on the blockchain using this. And transaction logic, which is a state logic of saying, I'm moving, you know, I was in one state, I'm moving to the other state. So it makes it very, very easy to implement blockchains uh, in Tezos. If you want to uh, implement a blockchain and you feel like using OCaml, that's, I, I recommend to you uh, using the, um, the modules that we, uh, that we have. But it also makes it very easy to incorporate innovation in the system, because we can iterate pretty quickly uh, using that code base. So can Tezos be everything to everyone? We talk a lot about interoperability in a world with many, many chains. I'm a, so I'm, I'm more skeptical of that aspect, and primarily because I think these things are mainly good at uh, being money, and money has very large network effect. I think the most liquid uh, medium of exchange tends to win. Um, but so why do we have to, you know, can we have many, many blockchains? So the case against that is first you have, first the trade-offs are limited, right? If you have many trade-offs, if you were designing a blockchain a certain way, and then, but then if you wanted to have some other goal, you would design it another way. For example, let's say there's a really good way of designing a blockchain for having smart contract, but if you do that, it makes it a very bad blockchain for doing something else. I, I don't believe there are big trade-offs. I think there's one big one, which is essentially decentralization and throughput, but that's from, that's Probably the, the, the only one that I think is a serious one. Uh, technology is replicable. Most of our space is uh, open source. Uh, but shelling points aren't. Uh, and in that respect, uh, Tezos has a, uh, has a, has a very large and uh, an awesome community. Interoperability is the opposite of a moat. 
So there's this idea that if you build something that's really, really interoperable, then you're not going to be competed against because you'll be the one unifying everyone. But the more interoperable you are, um, the more replaceable you are. And so network effects uh, of security tapers off exponentially fast. So you could say, I'm going to be the most secure blockchain, but if I have another, you know, if you have uh, 100,000 validators and I have 10,000 validators, uh, the safety becomes fairly similar. You could imagine safety, I think, as being exponential in the number of people who are actually checking something. So I only have about three minutes for questions, so uh, please share your questions about uh, Tedos for this presentation. What do you think will be the most common use for governance? So at first, you need governance in order to, uh, to decide the evolution of your technology, how your blockchains actually, uh, what, your block what does your blockchain actually do? Should we use this consensus or that consensus and so on and so forth? You need governance whenever you have a shared resource that several people don't agree on how to use. So having one chain is, is a shared resource. Uh, if you move to a world where it's easier to do uh, sidechains, for example, then you kind of lose this. Uh, you kind of lose this property of how important it is to change the technology because you could use a, a different technology in, a, in another sidechain. And so, at the end of the day, governance becomes only useful for determining issuance. At the end of the day, and then you know, ideally, I mean, in my ideal, ideal world, governance wizards. I see this as uh, something that's transient because there's changing technology. Uh, thanks very much. You talked about the diseconomies of scale that exist for validators or bakers in the Tezos proof of stake mechanism. Can you, it, to me, that this just struck me as normally the larger entity you are, the lower your cost of capital. So, can you just talk about the, the how, what are really the diseconomies of scale? Yeah. So when you talk of cost of capital, you're implying borrowing. And so if you don't have um, if you don't have good uh, if you don't have good lending markets or if you have uh, uh, high rates uh, and, uh, and not a lot of uh, not a lot of good uh, access to credits. Then you have these economies of scale. But it's like I said, it's an uphill battle. It stops it stops the minute where you have a very very liquid market for saying I'm going to be a validator, but I'm not going to own my own uh, tokens. I'm going to borrow the tokens from someone else, and I'll just be a pure service. Uh, but there, that does create friction because you still need to have some trust between the lender and the borrower. And th that trust acts as a friction, which will still push in the direction of, uh, I think, more decentralization. Hey, hello. Uh, I've seen a recent blog post written by you uh, considering uh, doing some uh, improvements on the Tezos protocol, and it looks like you're looking into Tendermint also. Can you walk us through? Yeah, so uh, right now, um, Tezos has uh, what has been described as a chain-based proof of stake algorithm, where essentially you're trying to, uh, to replicate the ideas of Nakamoto consensus, but do this with a uh, uh, with a, uh, but do this with proof of stake, with some BFT-ish aspect, which is that you have a bunch of validators who actually uh, 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 give evidence that they've seen a block after uh, after a block. Uh, in general, I think that the more the more I've been thinking about it, the more I don't like the synchrony assumption that you have in uh, uh, in these chain-based algorithms. Uh, and I think that having something uh, having some protocol which are uh, safe in partial synchrony actually lets you go faster, even if they have more communication. Uh, the fact that you don't have to make conservative hypotheses about the network lets you try to go as fast as possible. So something that I would imagine, which is a model that many uh, uh, people have converged on, is essentially doing sortition. So you uh, select a random set of validators in proportion to stake, and you have them uh, run some sort of BFT uh, uh, consensus. It, Tendermint is probably a fine implementation to do that. So it wouldn't be exactly Tendermint in the sense of like the validator set would change uh, pretty much at every block, which doesn't make it that easy to make a, uh, a Cosmos zone, but it's, uh, it's a general algorithm. It's, it's basically PBFT. Yeah. 
with some improvements. Thanks. Available to take questions in the speaker's corner. Uh, yes, I will. This. Okay, great. So you can take additional questions to Arthur. Thank you so much for the great presentation.